And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. Coming to us straight from the wonderful world of Shadowlands, in the red corner we have Arturo Osada, and in the blue corner we have David, don't call him Dean, Martin. Both Hi, Mildra. It's a pleasure Hi. to be here. How you, How you two doing? Um, glad, to glad to have you guys in, and bra especially with the braving the time zone hell to come over here to talk about the Winter King. Uh, no, no. I think it's a pleasure um, to be here. Uh, well, we're not very happy to bring the strong winter there, <laughs> but it's just you can blame the king. Mm -hmm. Well, first rule of leadership: it's all it's always the leader's fault. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> always good to be a leader. Yep. So. A bit of a tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, with that in mind, I'd like you both to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Okay, um, I'm going first, if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. mm, my first uh, time with role-playing games was at the university. Um, I was introduced to D and D mainly by video games, like Baldur's Gate, the, the first one, no, the third, of course. And I had a friend that say, "Oh, if you like that, do you try tabletop role playing games?" And then, uh, "No, what's that?" And they sit me on a table to play um, the old game about Lord of the Rings, the Middle Earth role playing. Uh, you know, uh, by on World Master, and it was uh, an absolute disaster. <laughs> we have we spent like two hours making the character cheat, and uh, well, we were killed by wolves in the first twenty minutes of the game. But um, something about the experience has got me hooked, and we um, we made a second attempt, much better, uh, until today. I'm still rolling my dice whenever I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that you, that um, Merp was Merp was used as the entry point. <laughs> me, for me personally, I'm not I'm not sure if that would have been my fir my first choice for for a newcomer, but it but it is what it is. Um. No, but, oh, good. Mm, sorry. but but then on Spain there aren't many role playing games published and translated. Um, uh, Merp was popular because you know the Tolkien setting, but yeah, it's a hard game to start with. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow that is a sim that was that was built as a simplified version of Rollmaster. Which make of make of that what you will. <laughs> but what about you, David? How how did you get your start? Well, uh, well, I started back in the days when I was a kid. I think I had twelve or thirteen years old, and a friend of mine uh, has a cousins that has the advanced Dungeons and Dragons. And he came one day and say, hey, I play something called Dungeons and Dragons and it's, it's great, it's, it's very funny. And, and, and he, <laughs> his parents, thinking about role-playing games, went to uh, <laughs> buy the, the, he, some some game and they found the Call of Cthulhu. Ah, this is a role playing game. Okay, well, here you have a twelve years old, thirteen years old, and Call of Cthulhu to play <laughs> role playing game. So well, he made 
uh, the scenario, we played the scenario, we loved the experience in our way, of course, it was nothing to, to do with a real Call of Cthulhu scenario or, or play. We were kids, we were crazy, we were funny all the time. But what's really good, that part of being the skiing of a character, be somewhere else, do we go for investigation or for adventure? And that's the part that makes me love role playing games in the beginning. And then it comes all the games. I try, for example, the Merp, try. Um, a, a superhero role playing game from there in Spain, and that is Superheroes Inc. And what we started to taste several things when come there into Spain, the War of Darkness, we try Vampire, we try Werewolf. And since today, it's I mean, love with role playing games. Mm -hmm. So Obviously, this is not your your guys' first rodeo. Com coming off of um, the coming off of your project inspired by the works of Edgar Allan Poe, and now with the Winter King, you guys are doing a um, dar a darker spin on Arthurian lore. So, how did the idea of doing of doing that with what would become the Winter King come to be? Okay, well, um, uh, uh, answer you, right. David, please. No, no, go ahead. No, I say it was um, an studio project because our CEO that uh, is not here because uh, <laughs> he is a little shy about speaking English. Uh, he he really loves uh, the Arthurian myth and all, all the movies, all the books. He reads a lot, and uh, he have the idea. Frank from Valverde have the idea to make um, an Arturian setting with a darker twist, you know? So, um, he started uh, Im imagining um, this dark, um, dark, what if, you no? Know, what if uh, our King Arthur died at the Battle of Canlan, but Mordor survives and become king, you know? What, what will... What would be that that dark boy thing? So um, he put us to work basically. Um, here at an auto because a, a, a guy called um, Thomas Sendarubias, that is an expert, is a philologist and a writer, and is an expert on the Arthurian myth. And he started developing this setting that um, somehow uh, takes um, from here and there, from a thousand years of myth, and develop um, his own his own story, his own version. Um, at the same time, we, we appeal to to people, to fans of the Arthurian settings, because there are a lot of Easter eggs and a lot of references. To classic literature, to since Chrétien de Troyes, from today, well, most modern versions of the myth. Um, but it's something like original with a dark twist, uh, different than the usual, um, I know, more the um, knight in shiny armor uh, version of the, uh, the Arthurian world. Mm -hmm. So, with the now, with that in mind, obviously the obviously the um, first thing that I th I think is worth co I think is worth covering is the um, Estripe system, which is get which is the name you're giving for the core mechanics of the Winter King. Uh, so it's in the update on in the update on GameFound where you talked about it, you meant you mentioned that it is a six it is a um, d6 based setup. Um, usually look usually looking for hits, but of either f of either fives or um, sixes. So is it a is it a case where you're doing it an attribute and skill formula, or is it or is it just 
um, abilities. I pass this to you, David, or I prefer if it has me who answers. Let's, let's turn there. <laughs> let's turn in the answers so we don't interrupt each other. It's okay. Okay. So, what the, the strip system is, it is based in a role playing game that see the light here a couple of years ago, I think. This uh, is strip. Uh, the Danish in Spanish somehow it's like uh, the lineage of Danish or strip of Danish using the academic uh, form of strip and it is based in all some kind of stats all both uh, abilities and skills in the same in the same way because they try to unite different aspects or um, the stats of of a character and put it together to make it flexible and simple. So we have uh, physical for everything that is athletics and everything you perform with your body, but you have technique and sapiens and converge all the things that had to um, dexterity and with a skill with hand and also for knowledge respectively in these two kinds but there are six six kind of uh, of abilities that we need all these and also we have the specialities as that are like uh, expertise that allow players to be better statistically when they roll dice because they can re-roll all the dice with uh, a value of failure and also permits that the successes the extra successes that we uh, that that deal with the with the roll can be used or accumulated to choose different benefits while they while they are developing the tasks. So such as doing it using less time, do it better, have benefits in later actions and later tasks, and also can activate uh, the combat skills, special movements, and also special traits while you perform magic. Mm -hmm. So it use this uh, main stats to allow players to create this this kind of benefit pool in just to to give a, a deep layer and give more. Um, flexibility in what the player wants to do with the character. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Arturo uh, can give you uh, a, a, a precise explanation if I left anything. Uh, no, I think it's just completely um... To address the, the the heritage of the system, um, the author uh, Enrique Camino um, can make a, a modern version, which has been inspired by the system every when using games like Barbarian of Lemuria. But um, so there are similarities in the basic role on in the use of specialties uh, called professions in the in that game, but. Um, he built a completely new system out of that. No? Seem maybe you have familiar mechanics, but they intertwine with each other in a completely unique way. Mm -hmm. So, with that with that in mind, when it comes to when it comes to character creation and um, advancement, is it a case where you guys are using a point by? Um, approach, or is there a different matter in how you're handling um, creating characters? 
Oh, character creation is really fast in streamlined. Um, use uh, is um, um, with a method of the distributing certain points. You have a uh, um, common pool, and you choose uh, where to put it in your capacities and in the, the magic you use. Um, to explain it shortly, uh, you have 15 points by the rest, and you have to um, distribute this between your capacities of vigor and dexterity and your fighting skills. And you have uh, two special points you can use to develop magic or um, uh, weapon masteries that unlock special movements on combat, or you can choose both, mix a bit of magic and a bit of combat expertise. Um, it's really easy, uh, so you simply have to choose your capacities and specialties, but um, the characters who... The resulting characters are, are really different from each other and have their own personality. Mm -hmm. I can I can get that now. Given that this is doing a darker spin on on the Athurian legend, um, that br that brings me to how how to maintain that feel when it comes to uh, combat. There's there's no shortage of developers who have their own version of make, of trying to make combat um, with a degree of gr with a degree of grit and a degree of high lethality. So I'm curious what your guys' approach is going to be towards that. Well, combat is flexible with these uh, cues that that players can do by choosing one action in combat or make chain action by uh, using their uh, rate in the ability that allows them to the, perform different options during combat. But the, the hard thing of combat, the, the dark twist of the combat, is that you have, in one hand, on one hand, you have the health, but in on the other hand, you have the the vigor, the uh, somehow an incapacity level. So you can receive um, injuries that lead you to loss of health, to have some consequences than broken bones, on uh, blood loss, and and that kind of things, but. In the other part, you are receiving uh, damage that can lead you to be knocked out. Hmm. So it's more easily see the characters coming knocked out in combat or be out of combat in some way or some fictional way. It's not only knock out, you can be uh, incapacitated by different ways or be out of combat because you, for example, fall from a uh, in a river and go uh, and get lost. And this incapacity uh, should occur uh, faster than characters die in, in, in the common way or, or the way we used to know in classical uh, role-playing games. So this uh, adds a, a flavor of, of risk when you face a combat or whatever it uh, to play. All right, I, I can I can get that. Now, I'm I'm I've been operating under the assumption that this is not a that this is not a game that's going to be using um cla classes or archetypes or anything like that. Which brings me to how you guys are get, are going to handle um the use of magic on the player end. Is it is it going to be a case where you are where um you're going you're where you're using it the same the same way as an ability? Is it something? Is it going to involve limited resources? How is magic going to work within the Winter King? Oh, as a matter of fact, the, the magic system is a brand new build for the Winter King. 
because uh, on a strip of planets, uh, we are using a more uh, Lovecraftian approach uh, to. So here you have more traditional fantasy magic, but it's, um, it's also a flexible system. You will have um, close spells that you can master, but uh, in the um, in the game master part of the book, you will the rules to make your own countries and spells, uh, whatever you want. Um, the system mixes uh, two concepts: uh, the the magic user can master different different ways of of access to to the supernatural powers. No, that you have. Um, Christian miracles, you have uh, totemic sex on magic, you have um, the magic of the fairies on the other side, the the, the, the magic world, the, the great forest. Uh, more or less all um, mechanical speaking functions the same way. The difference is you, the objects you can affect. How do we do that? Uh, you can have uh, four magic abilities, the abilities of read things, to analyze things with magic, for example, with mines or with a trail in the forest. You have the ability to manipulate the reality with, you know, chance um, hide your trail in the forest or uh, chance uh, someone in someone's mind about what they're thinking, you can create something from nothing and you can destroy what, uh, something that already exists. <laughs> These four abilities uh, will be separately uh, measured in the character sheet and you must use the abilities in uh, an object of the world. Uh, for example, the, those objects are more freely uh, defined by the player and the game master. For example, you can affect uh, wounds or you can affect uh, plants. So maybe you have, uh, um, let's say, two points of creating and uh, one point of domination of the wounds. No, you roll three dice to try to create a wound on your uh, on your rival or. Maybe your specialty is to read wounds, so you are a good medic, and you can uh, know exactly how to cure uh, the damage your partner has received. So mixing those two concepts, you know, the kind of magic and the object, the objective of the spells, you can on the fly during the the, the game. You can look for the exact. Uh, the exact use of this magic you need, not having to be limit or a close spell list. I'm. I hope I make myself more or less clear. Yeah, and the fact that you have a me a means present to allow people to use ma to use um to use their own created ma created magic is. Definitely something appreciated, since there's, since a lot of times, that is approached with, ju with a just wing it attitude, which is a bit, a bit, um. Yeah, you you have the both options now. You will have a long list of spells if uh, you know some players really um, didn't like to have to. Um, uh, Pick out of the hat some spell on the fly during the game. You have your basic list to pick ideas for it. But if you want to be creative, the game uh, completely allows you to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now, given that the, given that there's talk of different um, avenues of customization, with whether it be profession, lineage, ta talents, and the like. I know I said that this likely isn't going to be using classes, but it looks like you're using professions. So what would prof what would profession entail? Is it a case of le um, leaning into a certain role, much like say Cyberpunk Red, or is it is it more of a narrative aspect? How is it going to work?
Okay, I, I take that. Do we want to uh, be used like exactly profession? That you have whatever character concept you, you want. You can be a hunter, or you can be a mage, or you can be a knight, or you can be a, a bard or a monk. Uh, we, what we have are specialties. So that's the, the specialties which make the difference, or to say. Mm, we have uh, two characters, both uh, with three points on bigger, on strength. Um, but maybe my character was um, former um, former acrobat, no, traveling a traveling actor. And uh, my specialty is to climb, and my specialty is to jump. No, but uh, your character is more of a warrior kind, so maybe your specialty on bigger is uh, strength, feathers, and resistance. No, so I intend to be more successful when I roll um, athletic feats, and you'll be more successful than me when you have to show brute strength. No, we can apply this concept to any of the basic abilities of the character. You know, maybe your high dexterity character is um, a shadow guy, uh, completely stealthy, and my high dexterity character is a um, blacksmith and a skilled artisan. Uh, my my perk is to doing beautiful objects and repair armors. Um, to, um, for example. Yeah. Now, obviously, with the with several of the stretch goals, there's been um, announcements about at about adding new new clans. So I'm cur I'm curious if you're ch about what what um your choice of clan would entail. Is it a is it a case where there's certain sk certain skills that are like that that it's going to have a leaning towards? Is it going to be granting some um, ability, how is that going to work? Yes, one, one thing that we uh, wanted to, to focus in, in the Winter King is that the bloodline matters. So the ancient knights that were the company of King Arthur and they most of them fall in Kamlan, then where they, uh, they get lost and exiled. So the descendants and, and the families uh, that are related to them matter. So it's kind of uh, the call of destiny, and you have have to choose if answer this this call, this destiny, or you turn around and give destiny your back. So. In this this way, this um, blood bound somehow to to the descendant of the ancient knights, we wanted that matter. So, it, in the way that there are some skills that are related with the clan, not only um, uh, born skills that every person, they, every character of the clan may have, but also a path that you can follow where there are some milestones. If you follow your destiny, of, if you follow the call of what may be the path of this family uh, and that can lead you to different, uh, somehow a, a tree of new traits that you can, well, in some points of the advancement of the character, you can choose and you can give a even more layer to get more special your character using the background, using your origins and using the bloodline for the clan that you belong. So in this case, we we want to give any as as many options as, as we can as the project get uh, higher and there's more stretch goals unlocked 
So, well, there are many different clans as um, options during character creation. We think is uh, a good thing to have for players for uh, not only uh, have skills and stats, but also to have a background and have a history in the back of their characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that can certainly make sense. Now, I would like to shift a little bit into the campaign that you're that you're also adding in into into the um, package, the Book of Mordred. Which is, which, as I understand it, is meant to be the primary campaign book for the Winter King. Yes, yes, it is. It's uh, like um, the main epic campaign of the setting, a setting that will be expanded uh, in the future, we hope. Especially with the um, uh, really good support we are receiving on GameFound. But the boot of Mordred was uh, like the story was grow at the same time with the rules of the game. Is uh, okay, the story you can expect of a on a setting like that? No, you have a dark place, a dark ring. You have a tyrant called Mordred, and you have your heroes to whom must answer that destiny call and defeat the tyrant or try to defeat the tyrant um with uh, resurrecting the powers uh, of the summer kingdom of king arthur you have to follow the path of your ancestors poof worry um maybe if you are lucky now uh defeat moderate her himself you might think, okay, but mm, this should be the end of the set. No, not necessarily. Moderate is not the only villain in the Stark Britain. Yeah. Uh, I can, I can get that now. Is is this going to is is this going to be a case where, with adv shifting to advancement for a moment, where you're where um. It's a, where you're gaining experience and spending it directly to improve what you have. Um, sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, I think I think the the angle that I'm going with is with the with um the book of Mordred. Is that going to be a long a um long a is it a longer form o overall arching, or is it a, is it a case of of a collection of individual um, stories, or is there a mix of both within that book? Well, if it's a a huge arc, you can start with the first that is more or less define the the first uh, scenario. But then it opens uh, um, into many options, up to seven scenarios, I, if I don't recall. But um, and it can be played inside uh, your own campaign. It can be used one of each, each time. You can choose the order. It's like a sandbox somehow. Uh, which you can you can think about the these parts of the campaigns like chapters, then you can choose when to to play. So the order depends uh, on what is doing the reaction of the antagonist in the in this campaign. But also you can stop playing the second scenario and then link with your own. Uh, with your own scenario that you're made because of the consequences of the decision of the players and then come not with the third but with the fifth chapter and then go back with the third and then go to the sixth so it's flexible in the way you can play but the arc is, in the meaning of facing Mordred and resurrecting as Arturo has said before the lost powers of the realm of Sama 
uh, is the, the I say I would say the, the center of the the PCT to front face the not only the destiny but also to get the background from where we from we we're getting here with the high king moderate and now facing it with touching all the twisted and tainted powers that are now in Britain and the other world and this kind of course magic in some points of the campaign. So I would say that for the moment is the center campaign and can be played in different ways. I say using your own input and or if you can play it, you can play it in the order you want. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm answering your question or if I get lost in my own mind <laughs> trying to answer it. I can, I, I, yeah, I can get where you're coming from on this. So Well, th that's not the only planned campaign that there are going to be. In fact, one of the stretch goals unlocked, the Queen Without a Throne, it's not a short adventure, it's more like a short campaign of a large scenario. Mm -hmm. So there's many ideas and many plans to to give more content, more scenarios and more options of game uh, now in the in the game fun campaign and in the future in this game line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with that in with that in my, with that in mind, when it comes to, I know, I know that you've you've talked about putting out a um, sample ver a sample version of the rule set with a introductory campaign. Um, do you guys have a release window in, in mind for that? <clears throat> it's um. It's a work in progress right now, especially the English translation and the final um, illustration and visual thoughts. We strongly hope uh, we can release it uh, before the end of the campaign, maybe in next week or in a couple of weeks. Um, in this guide, you will have uh, the basic rules set, uh, enough for playing a few games yourself uh, and an example scenario called The Lay of the Green Knight. I can, I can get that. So, with that, with that in mind, when it comes to the, when it comes to the um, full, the full, the full setup that you have, it, lo it looks like you're also, you're also planning on putting in a um, starter set that has the adventure, the green light, green knights lie. Um, I'm I'm not gonna ask I'm not gonna ask for the full details on that, but what it, but what is the premise of that particular adventure? <clears throat> Sorry, it's um, it's a first scenario, not designed to give you some familiarity with the, with the setting. Um, without making much spoilers, uh, I told you you have to reenact the legend of the Green Knight. No, it's one of the probably most well-known um, pieces of, of knowledge of the Arthurian myth, and also uh, we had there was a recent movie, recent movie that retold this legend, and the characters will find that uh, the Green Knight has back, um, have faced more to it. Um, things going a little awry from that. You know, the, in the original legend, the Green Knight enters the court of King Arthur and say, okay, who's brave enough to, to, to defeat me? You know? I let uh, any one of you give me the, your best hit. The condition is I will be back on a year and I strike you back the same, the same way. So Gawain, that one 
probably the boldest of the knights of the round table say let me let me do this and with only one hit he beheaded he cut the head of, of the green knight um everyone gets surprised when the green knight picks up his own head put it back over their shoulders and say okay see you in a year and well the story you can read it it's a, bit, it's a story with uh, a <laughs> Several centuries old, so it's, I think it's not counting as a spoiler. But uh, the Green Knight gets back after a year, um, starts a trouble with Gawain, and um, didn't kill him. Still, proof uh, her value with several quests. But our adventure would go a different path. No? Let's say the Green Knight want also want to prove that Mordred was an honorable king. Um, Mordred wasn't a honorable king, so uh, your characters will have to resolve uh, the great, great problem um, created there. Mm -hmm. so I, I can go in, if we put a spoiler alert and can explain more about the, the adventure, but I think that's the the selling the selling speeds. Yeah. Yeah. I've Obviously, while, while the story of the Green Knights is is one where the ma the spoiler mandate has passed, I'm not I'm not going to have you um, go go too go too far into the sto the um, story that's within that mo that that module. Now, in that module, uh, okay, if you want to play the module, mm, <laughs> uh, fast forward a, bit, a few minutes. Uh, we start uh, in um, Carwent, a fortress in in Wales. Uh, now to the frontier with Britain, and the characters will be contact during a hunting. Uh, will be contact with a priest of the Sarnunus, one of the old Saxon and Celt gods. Uh, which the Green Knight is an aspect of. You no, know, it's, uh, it's like an avatar of Sarnunus, but when he he go to prove more, it was tricked about the dark magics of Morgaus the queen of darkness and air and was captured so more that beheaded again the green knight but mm, mm, this dark magic prevent him to to reconstruct her body his body and uh, Mordred trapped the head in a cage in a town circle and is using the powers of the green knight to control the weather in Britain to be sure the people less loyal to him uh, have to experience long winters, short, short springs, uh, you know, but um, but harvest on the fields, less food, and so on. So the characters will have to the Benta Belgarum, uh, the capital of the King Mordred, and we have to investigate. Uh, the whereabouts of this head and try to free the Green Knight. That's basically the story. It's an adventure you can play maybe in four or five hours, you know, a long, uh, a long session or, or two, two shows one. Or if the characters want to go wild and explore more of the city, maybe you can even uh, more than three, five sessions, maybe this span, but it's designed to be a, a demo, no? To, um, an adventure you can play on um, on one long session mm -hmm. in conventions and so on. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. So now I do want to congratulate you on how on how well the Oh, crowdfund has been doing. You guys were asking for nine thousand euros, um, and it's currently at eighty-one thousand and change at the time of this recording. But what would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window? Not a not a hard date per se, but a ballpark. You know, and a. A round, a round estimate as far as an air, an area in the year that you'd pr that you'd probably try and shoot for release. Sure. 
Soy, soy fotógrafo de Jafa. I'm not going to do here. Uh, you are, were asking uh, when the game will be ready for release? Just just in a, just a general area that a general um, time frame that you guys are shooting for, not a um, hard date. Um, our plan uh, have to um, the physical books uh, will be the, the, the delivered around summer next year, around June or July of 2025. The PDF version uh, will be ready probably on January next year. So we are giving the more realistic, uh, the, more, the more realistic data we have. Uh, maybe we can get the game faster, but we prefer to be cautious with that and and be uh, have put the cans to the table. No, we have uh, the game is it's uh, it's designed, but all the process of illustration and so on. Uh, have to to be done. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that, and I will certainly look forward to seeing how it develops. But with that in with uh, with all that said, I do want to sincerely th thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the. A uh, bit of madness that happens around here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mesa. Uh, if you want, we can uh, came back when the game was really re ready to, to hit the retail stores. Oh, I'd, I'd certainly be open to that. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!